Podcast time. What's up, everybody? We've been throwing them out there. Trying to do two a week. Got a lot of different topics, both at The Foul Life as well as This Life Ain't For Everybody. And please don't forget about the brand new episodes coming out weekly over at Where the Pavement Ends with Clay and Clint and Crossbow and all their guests talking about big game and rifles and ballistics and archery and scouting and application processes and the draw system. I know they got Travis McClendon from Zero Guide Services coming back for a couple episodes. So check them out. Today's episode of the Fowl Eye Podcast, again, is brought to you by our friends at Gerber Gear Stay Sharp America. We're fired up to be using the best blades, saws, hatchets, axes, you name it. Gerber's got it. They're affordable. They're made in America, right in the state of Oregon. And we have them in our trucks, our boats, our UTVs, on our ATVs, in our blind bags, our toolboxes, our deck systems, our pockets. You never can go wrong with carrying a sharp blade. Use them safely. Watch out for your phalanges when you're cutting those back straps out of an elk or those tenderloins and breast meat out of a mallard duck. My guest today knows a little about both of those. Actually, a lot, a lot, a lot about both of those. I brought Dave Stanley back, and here's why before I let him say what's up. We've been getting inundated with public land questions. Um, How... Do you know where to go is a big one. How do you scout? How do you find the ducks? Where can you go? Where should you go? How do you know where the ducks like to be in these certain areas, whether it's a public marsh, whether it's a refuge system? I've hunted a lot of public property in my experience, but Dave Stanley has hunted it a lot more, and he is the reason why I really learned how to hunt public property and then got to venture into some of the private areas that we're so humbled and lucky to hunt. Dave Stanley, welcome. Thank you, Chad. Always good to be here. What's going on, buddy? Well, you know, it's a long, hot summer right now. <laughs> Looking forward to some fall and, you know, for waterfowlers, we got some pretty good news early this week that they're going to let us across the Canadian border. So that's a good thing. And, uh, you know, get your vaccinations. <laughs> Do you think that the waterfowl have any idea what's getting ready to happen to them? <laughs> no. <laughs> There's going to be some pent-up aggression <laughs> like serious, in September and October. Like serious windshield time looking for them. They might actually stop the migration. <laughs> I wonder if they were smart enough to be like last year in Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Like, what the heck's going on? Yeah, where are those guys? Yeah, this isn't right. <laughs> well, I'm usually freaking scared for my life right about September 3rd. All the way until I get down to Montana. Then the pressure lessens up a tiny bit when I get to Montana. or or. But if they're a little bit east of there to North Dakota, I bet you North Dakota got hammered last year. Yeah. But I wanted to bring you in because we've been getting a lot of questions about scouting, public property. Um, it's one of those things to where I know you get to hunt private property at the Canvasback Duck Club. You also go up to Canada, which you can go and ask for permission. But a lot of that is more so of driving around with the binoculars and a lot of scouting that goes into that. So there's scouting in all different types of hunting. Today, I wanted to concentrate on public property because I would say a probably 90% of the waterfowl hunting personnel or community in our country hunts public property. Maybe maybe a little bit more than that, maybe a little bit less. But would you say it's way up there, way more than private property hunters? I would think so because there's typically duck clubs are not large organizations. You know, <clears throat> most of the ones I've been, you know, lucky enough to go to or whatever don't have hundreds or hundreds of members or anything like that. You know, they have a few members up to maybe 100 members like the Canvasback Club does. But, um, but that's rare. I mean, most duck clubs are, you know pretty small group of guys so i would think that the vast majority of waterfowl hunters do hunt at least a portion of their year if not all their year on public land and so the first issue there is how do you identify public land and there's some tools out there now that are crazy good i mean everybody has a cell phone you can get the onyx program on x o n x um a hunt program and and it with the overlays they have i mean it tells you exactly where private and public land are and uh, that that, so that simplifies that part of it considerably and there's other programs like that but that one seems to be the most popular one right now and and it's easy to use Um, uh, so you know i think the first part of that is finding some public land that you can and want to hunt you know Um, the second part of that the you know the scouting 
Scouting for waterfowl in the summertime is a, you're, you're scouting for spots. You're not scouting for birds at that point, typically, because of the migratory nature of waterfowl. Um, you know, so when you go, <clears throat> you know, I'm out fishing on a lake, I see a interesting looking backwater or something, you know, I'm going to row back up in there or motor back up in there and look at it. And I've found some pretty good spots to, to try or to at least look at later in the season to see if the birds find them. You know, you look at the vegetation and everything and go, well, they could be here. I mean, if, if they're here, they're going to be happy here. So that's just a matter of whether they find it. Um, in the West, we're a little lucky, uh, luckier in most cases that you have a pretty good horizon to to view this stuff from, you know, there's not a lot of trees, certainly not where we hunt in the Central Valley of California or where we hunt immediately, you know, in Nevada, it's, it's just high desert, you know, there's no trees. Um, you know, when you get back east, like where I grew up, uh, you know, hunting in the beaver ponds and, and sloughs and hunting for wood ducks and mallards in the trees, um, it's a different story there, you know, there you are just literally looking for a spot, you know, and, and the, all of the right, um, factors that will make the ducks want to be there in October and November and December and January when you're, you know, can shoot them. Um, so it's it, preseason scouting is, is, as I said, it's looking for spots, you know, and you can do that a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I know guys in Arkansas that walk through the timber when it's dry in the summertime. And I mean, if there's a hole in the timber in the summertime, there's going to be a good hole in the timber in the wintertime because the leaves are off the trees. <laughs> you know, the holes are pretty small this time of year. Um, uh, and, and that's a good way to do it. Uh, again, you know, knowing where the public and private land are is critical because you don't want to get in trouble. And and uh, then that's easy enough to do with a variety of different programs, you know, um, that you can put on your cell phone. Uh, other than that, it's you're just I guess it's the kind of hunting you want to do um, you know a lot of uh, if guys goose hunt you know a lot that's what they concentrate on well there's not a lot you can do in the summertime for that I don't think other than you know if you're in the farm belt looking at the crops and figuring out you know the crops the geese like and then knowing that those are the guys you want to ask for permission if the geese you know, and you may go meet the farmers and say, hey, you know, do you let people hunt? And then then at least you're not cold calling him the day before you want to go hunting. And there's a thousand geese in this field and three other cars in his driveway. <laughs> you know, you've, you've got you've made a contact with them. So a lot of that is is, you know, just just basically doing your homework ahead of time so that you have some idea of what you're going to do. And once we get into the season, or at least within a week or two of it, where the birds are migrating already, and, you know, you can go to the spots where you would hunt, and there are presumably going to be ducks there, um, you know, then you can do more serious scouting as far as where you want to be in a particular wind or the sun or, you know, all of that, and how much water is in this pond versus that slough over there. Uh, this year in Nevada, certainly, on public land, it's going to be a difficult hunt. You know, I mean, we were having a terrible drought, and, and a lot of our wetlands, particularly in the western part of the state, won't have any water in them. Um, eastern Nevada fared a little better in the winter than we did, and so, um, you know, there's some places there where where uh, where they will still go, but w in Nevada we we need that big footprint of water, right? And so when the Humboldt Sink and the Stillwater Marsh and and those big areas like that have water in them, the birds stop on their migration. When we don't, they may stop, but they may only overnight or stay for a day or two. Or certainly once they start getting shot at, they're gone. So that's the you know that's the issue, and that's why it makes scouting important um it'll be even more important this year just just to find a spot you know um, so you've added a totally different level to the game now so when i said scouting i'm my mind automatically goes to you know the birds are here and you're out with your binoculars sure. i want to get into your kit you know your arsenal of what do you have you mentioned your cell phone and apps like onyx uh, hunt wise there's uh there's several of them onyx is from what i hear the best one out there and the most popular but before that, now you brought another level of the game of <clears throat> if you're out there in August, September, before the migration really starts, you're not in Canada in September scouting when the season's going on. You're scouting your local area of the public area that you're going to be hunting. It's, it's very smart to have this visionary or visualization process of like, whoa, I could see myself hunting there. Let's go out there and look at that. Like I've done that so many times 
you know, hunting arrowheads and mm-hmm. I'll look at a bluff and I'll be like, I bet you we could call a coyote from right exactly. there. You know, exactly. Exactly what rim, I'm talking about. Right? Yeah. So then you can, so you start visualizing these hunts and then now we're talking about pre pre you know preseason scouting of like man I could if I'm in this area at least now I have options now when it comes to now the birds are supposed to be here I'll go back and check those spots and see and then that's when you start saying okay my hide's here the wind's going to be coming out of the southeast or the northwest or whatever it's going to be mm-hmm. you can start planning your hunt right so this is this is an interesting thing of <clears throat> or an interesting point you bring up Dave as far as what steps do we take for this time of the year scouting do we go to our departments of wildlife and get a map do we use the the apps like we've talked about but is there advice that you can get from like the rules and regulations where you can drive an automobile what times of the year you can have a boat on water if you're going to choose to scout by boat there's a lot of that kind of stuff that goes into this too right there is absolutely um and and a lot because we have so few wetlands in nevada and i use that example because that's where we are you know, most of them you can't run a boat on for at least February to the middle of June. And some of them you can only run a boat during the waterfowl season, period. That's it. You can't scout the day before the season, nothing, you know, in a boat. Um, so, you know, you got to you got to walk and look around. And 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 when you're when you're looking for those spots you know, everybody knows what a good looking little slough or whatever looks like. But the things that that often get overlooked is you need to look and see if the food is there, <laughs> if there's a reason for the ducks to be there. You know, and um, in, in our part of the country here, when ducks go to loaf, they're going to go load falcon on sheep, sheet water someplace, you know, where they're wide out in the wide open. Nobody bothers them. If a boat comes within a mile of them, a half a mile of them, they'll get up and just fly farther away. Right. Um but you want you want places where they're going to go to feed, and um, and and they'll certainly loaf there too. But primarily, there's got to be a reason for them to get there, is what I'm saying, you know. And um, so, it, knowing what the ducks eat in your part of the world is a big part of this summertime, you know, because you can spin your wheels a whole bunch looking at water and marshes and sloughs and timber holes or whatever, um, you know, in the summer. And then when the water shows up, there's no birds there. Or, you know, when the birds show up, they don't choose to go there. And and generally, I find that it's because there wasn't any food there to start with, you know. Um, so keep that in mind when you're doing it. You want to be looking for whatever the prevalent natural food source is for them. What about when you get in a situation where it's a river system and you're on a boat, you're fishing, and you see a bunch of mallards that, that they might be locals, but they're in a certain spot. Maybe it's because... There's a sandbar, there's good shellfish in that area, there's invertebrate, there's something that's keeping those ducks in that area. So <clears throat> you go back there in the you know closer to the season and there's more mallards. What are the laws that a, a waterfowl hunter and the you know the regulations that you have to start keeping in mind of accessing rivers? If they're is there private property on a river on the approach where the the property and the land butts up against it on both sides of the river? If you stay in the river, can you hunt from a boat blind? Can you back your boat blind up against the shoreline if it's on a private sure. property? You know what I'm saying? There's a high I water did. mark. Tell me a little bit about what a guy or girl needs to know going into a river and, situation. And so every state's different. Unfortunately, there's no uniform. Or I don't know if it's unfortunate, but there's no uniform law. Um you know, typically in Nevada, uh, we don't have a whole lot of streams, you know, but the rivers we have are most of them were used for commerce at some point. So they're considered navigable streams. Therefore, it's the public domain to the normal, not the flood, but the normal high water mark. OK, so y- you might be standing on the bank, but as long as you're below the high water mark, you're OK. You're on you're on in the public domain. In Nevada, you don't own the stream bed. Um, in some states in the West, you do. You know, I mean, they fence, fence river system, you know, there'll be a fence across the river really? <laughs> at a guy's property line. And, to, and that's partially to keep people from floating down there, but also just keep his cows in, whatever. Um, so that the river thing is, particularly if you spend a lot of time on a, a river or two during the summer fishing or doing whatever you're doing, you know, you want to have a GPS or some program on your phone where you can drop those pins 
so you don't have to remember which bend it was every time, you know, and and then you'll you'll as you go back a few times over the course of the summer, you'll start to see a pattern develop that there's more of them here and fewer of them out here for whatever reason, and um, you know I, I in, at least in the west. The rivers don't change a whole bunch. You know, we don't get big floodwaters in the in the uh, November, December, January time frame like they do in the like they hope for in the South. You know, I mean, they want the Mississippi and the White and those to come up at least into the bottomlands, so all those trees are flooded. You know, here, um, with a few exceptions, the Sacramento River being one of them, we really don't have that. Um, we don't have that situation very often where where it's flooding a whole bunch of territory that isn't currently flooded, you know. So, uh, and, that, and that's another thing you have to watch out for because if we had a big runoff in the spring, which we didn't have this year, but if we did, there'll be a whole lot of backwaters back there when the river drops that are just nice little ponds. And if you go see one in June or July and there's a whole bunch of ducks in it, local birds, and you go back on the opening morning in the dark and you walk in there and there's no water in it because it dried up, you know, so you have to be aware of what happens has a constant supply of water and what doesn't. The, the ones that, that get cut off from the river can often be good to hunt, but they have to be deep enough to survive the evaporation until the season opens, obviously. When, when you start thinking about all of the different ways that you could become, you know, the different waterways we're talking about to hunt during the season, there's, you know, there's big water, there's big lakes that hold ducks, there's there's buck brush holes, there's marshes, there's river systems, there's creeks, there's hot water, there's sloughs, there's all these different things. But would you say that when it comes to scouting, that your bag of tricks as far as what you bring with you, is yours pretty simple or do you tell somebody, hey, have the tools in your toolbox to really scout meaning like do you go as far as a pair of binoculars a spotting scope a notepad are you taking notes on your phone are you doing voice memos to where you can remind yourself you already mentioned dropping pins on an app or marking a location on your google maps or your your apple maps Mm -hmm. Um, what are some of the things that a guy or a girl should be like okay i'm going to take this because a lot of people think oh i'm just going to drive around and remember that spot you've already said you 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 know you're going to have too many to remember and then Mm -hmm. you're going out there in the dark and then you're trying to find the right spot and if you're off 75 yards you might not get them fred right. zink told me that a long time ago you could be 75 yards off the x and not get the mallards they, the they know where they're going. important <laughs> so what what do you use when you're hunting when you're scouting public property and what would you tell somebody hey make sure you have these tools sure um we we all get familiar with the places we hunt a lot. So it's a little different than a place that you hunt year after year after year after year because you have that historical knowledge of it. And hopefully you do have a notebook, at least at first, and you keep track of it or you keep notes on your phone. But at the, at the minimum for scouting, you need your phone with a GPS and some way to mark spots, okay? And, and preferably a map program you can look at so you can see what you're, the aerial view of what you're looking at um, and a good pair of binoculars. Um, I don't typically have to go as far as a spotting scope out here because we have, you know, big vistas and ducks are pretty easy to pick out, you know, um, uh, in most um, situations, not 100 percent. But um, so, you know, those would be the two things that I would absolutely have Um, a, you know, most of the that I've found anyway, most of the mapping that exists, paper maps are you're way better off using your phone. I mean, you really are, you know, because you can expand it out as big as you want because um, the detail on marshes and things, you know, often is they just put it on the map at the high water mark. It looks nothing like what it looks like when you're looking at it, you know, unless it happened to be a big year. So um, uh, so just remember that with maps, you know, that, that you need to walk the edge of that thing at least a ways and make sure it's like it's depicted on the map or... Um, you know, or just walk it so you know exactly what it's like. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, so being willing to just remember, it's like anything else. It's like fishing. It's like any hunting you've ever done. The farther you go from where you park your truck, the fewer people that are going to be there. Right. You don't want to go way far in the wrong direction, though. <laughs> you want to go where it's going to do you some good. But if you make that walk in in July or August, probably August or even August or September, late August and September. 
because then you're getting close to the season and the water levels aren't going to change that much. Um, if, if you do your hiking around then where it's legal to do that in most places it is, then you're going to have a pretty clear idea of what it's like, you know, what it's going to be like. But the binoculars, invaluable, scouting anytime, anywhere, um, except in the trees where you can't see anything. And, uh, you know, and like I say, the cell phone just the, vo- the, the ability to just make voice notes on it that you may can later because you found a better spot as you kept going or whatever, but at least you have that information, right? It's a 14 minute walk going Northwest into here. So you know how to do it in the dark, you know, look at your compass on your phone and figure out what you're doing. Um, so that, you know, you don't miss it by a hundred yards. Exactly what you were talking about. Freddie said, you know, I mean, I've done it. <laughs> I've done it wrong. I've done it wrong enough times that now, even on places that I hunt a lot, I'll take a, um, I'll take a heading when I come out of the ramp, you know, if I'm using a boat, and that's typically where I, what I'm doing early if it's dark in the morning, and, and I'll, I'll know exactly the heading I need to go to and the point to point that I need to change it when I get to this channel or that one or whatever. And, and so it's a little tedious writing it down, but you're going to go out there and go for a boat ride anyway, so what the heck, you know? And in places where you're not allowed to do it when you're hunting, then do it on the way back in, you know, the day you go hunting. Um, just so you can recreate that or, or you saw a better spot, then go to that spot and, you know, make your trail backwards into the landing so you can follow that, that line again. Um, you know, the electronics really make it easy. Yeah, to get we're living right. in like the heyday. Right? I mean, it's be crazy, the stuff, you know, that, that helps you scout. But I mean, some sort of a GPS or, you know, cell phone type program is invaluable. And then, you know, and then knowing what you're looking at. So that's that's what the, where the binoculars come in handy. You know, I mean, if you want to go shoot mallards, you don't want to be sitting on a spot that's full of ringnecks or whatever, you know. Um, love shooting ringnecks, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, you know, I've seen people go, you know, hey, there's nothing but divers here. Well, you know, when you looked out there and saw all those ducks, that's all there was. But you just looked at them from your car seat, the naked eye, and so you didn't, you know, you didn't know what they were until you got out there the next day or whatever. So binoculars... And you'll just find a lot of spots sitting out there just looking around, you know. And obviously for waterfowlers, once the migration has started, um, early and late is, you know, going to be the times that the ducks get up on their own and fly around. But it's amazing, as long as it's not oppressively hot, how much flying around they do in the middle of the day before we start hunting them. Once we start hunting them, they head for the big water, you know, in the middle of the day where they can just hang out and they know they're not going to be bothered. Um, but uh, so then and, and, and scout- that's true most places I've hunted actually you know even yeah. even when we hunted the beaver sloughs and everything and, and you know where I grew up hunting in, in the south it just um, um, those birds would leave you know you'd shoot in the morning and you'd shoot in the evening and, and, and you could jump shoot during the middle of the day which we did and my dad loved to do that and so we would we'd just walk all day but you wanted to be in a spot where you knew the birds were going to come to first thing in the morning or that last hour or two before dark because there were wood ducks which always come back to the same spot and you know mallards and black ducks was always shot for till i was 20 years old i bet you know um which wasn't bad i mean i'm not complaining right it was great but um you know it's a completely different deal than than scouting out here where you know there might be 10 or 12 species of ducks out there you know i mean if you saw ducks back home you knew they were one of the three, and wood ducks are pretty easy to tell. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, then it's either them or black ducks and mallards. So, um, but out here, but you got a great variety, which is awesome. I mean, I, I once I moved to Nevada, I learned how to hunt divers. I love it. Nothing's more fun than shooting a couple of those bull cans, you know. And the kids came out last year. Of the year, well, last year was COVID, I guess, but you know, they came last year yeah, too. Right though. before, COVID but anyway, they came out and hunted in the Stillwater Marsh there, and you know, they all shot canvas backs and. Most of them had never shot a duck before, much less a canvas back before. And and when you shoot one of those things in February, I mean, that's an amazing trophy. I don't care what anybody says. They're spectacular birds. And, and, you know, not everybody gets that opportunity in, you know, in some little marsh out in the middle of the desert. So we're pretty lucky that way. 100%. On the, you made mention of, you know, don't, if you, the further you walk away, you're, there's going to be less people. So, but as we transition into during the season scouting, because mm-hmm. we start looking for a lot of other things, you start to look at 
um, weather forecast. You look at the 10 day, the extended, you look at the moon phase, you start to look at, you know, what the wind is going to be doing. You're going to look at the change of the wind. Then you're looking like, well, is there going to be ice? Is there going to be a thaw? There's all kinds of things that you have to have a playbook for during the season. And as you start to transition into that, I wanted to make mention of everything changes once opening day starts. Like you might find the Correct. best spot in the world and get there and be 11 trucks, like you mentioned. And I was going to go here before you said that, so I'm glad you did, is options, right? If you get there and you got beat to the hole, that's public property. So then etiquette and ethics start playing into this. And then you have to have options. Those options are important because you have to have several options for this wind, these conditions, this wind, and these conditions, because you don't want to get there and the guy and, and his wife beat you to the hole because it's going to be a south wind. And now you got to go hunt a hole that would only be prevalent on a, you know, a, a good on a prevalent north wind. Right. So how important is having options and plan A, plan B, because everything changes you know it's like it with the waterfowl hunting preseason scouting you're going to be on cloud nine being oh i found the spots well i'm right. sure that if it's public property somebody else may have also exactly you know you're not you're <laughs> not you're not the only guy out there even if you never see anybody when you're scouting you're not the only guy out there doing it um it is probably you know opening day is a event of its own at least in this part of the world and well everywhere i've ever duck hunted it is and and it reshuffles the deck instantly one day changes what the ducks do you know because um because they haven't been getting shot at there and all of a sudden you're shooting at them again and you know and the older ducks know what to do you know let's go sit in that open water over there <laughs> and the younger ducks get killed and and some of the older ones certainly do as well but it's um the, the your your question or your comment about you know what do i do when i get to that uh get to my parking area and i went an hour earlier than i thought i needed to and there's already three trucks there and i have no idea where those guys are so you know i I put on a headlamp so they can see me coming, right? Because if it's a half a mile out there to this spot, I want them to start flashing their flashlight at me after I've only walked 100 yards. I don't want to walk a half a mile, and then the guy says to me, hey, we're already set up here. <laughs> you know, So it's, it's a better idea to identify yourself with some kind of light so, so that people can see you coming, okay? Uh, and you can also see other people coming. Um, the, you know, the worst... The worst experiences I've ever had on public land were typically on opening morning and typically with people who don't duck hunt all the time. That's the only day or maybe they duck hunt Thanksgiving weekend or Christmas week or something. Uh, but opening day is really their only duck hunt of the year. And, you know, so they don't they don't understand how it works. Right. You know, I mean, they don't understand the etiquette or at least what we perceive the etiquette to be. And so you've, you've got to you got to kind of take the temperature of the people around you and, and figure out what you're going to do. But in that case, you, you do need to have options, you know, and I'm not going to go set up 300 yards from somebody if I can avoid it. You know, I mean, that sounds like a long ways, but it's not right. You know, um, and uh you know, so you do want to you do want to have options, and and usually my options are going to be I'm going to have spot number one, number two, and number three that are at least in the same area. And on opening day, I'm going to go way earlier than I think I need to, not so I can beat everybody there, but so that when I get to the spot I want to hunt, I'm going to put my stuff out, and I'm going to you know at least try to keep them from setting up a hundred yards away from me. Right? That's about all you can do on public land. I mean, you know, you just go, hey, bud, you know. I can't keep you from setting up there, but I shoot that way and you're way too close to me and I don't want you shooting this way, you know, and you try to have a civilized conversation and usually it works out fine, you know, occasionally it doesn't, but, but you just, uh, you know, you deal with it. Um, anyway, that's, I do think it is important because, because I've done it wrong before where you go and you've got your buddies or your grandkids or whatever you've got with you and your kids and, uh, you know, you put all your eggs in one basket thinking, man, I haven't seen anybody out here all summer long, nothing. And you get there and and you're already out there and set up. You're the first guy there. It's all great. And then, you know. You made mention that in a historical, if you're hunting this place where you've been hunting for years, those guys might, they already have their game plan. And they, Correct. they didn't have to scout. It's the, the only summer. place they know where to hunt. You yeah. know, in a lot of cases, that's they, they hunt the same place every opening day. I mean, because I talk to them, you know, and, and, and find out what's going on. And so you have to take that into account. Um, uh, Let me ask yeah. you this real quick, Dave. I yeah. Know. 
Is there a law, like we were talking about the rivers and the laws in different states, and I, I assume this is going to be different state by state, which brings up a huge thing in scouting because you got to scout the rules and regulations too. It's, it's oh, yeah. no ignorance to the law. You might, if you're going to Nevada opening day, you know, like I've wanted to have this dream of killing unlimited ducks in Tennessee, Southeast Missouri, and Kentucky in the same day. We can't do it. Right. You can only kill one limit of ducks federally. So you might kill two in Tennessee and one in Kentucky and the rest of them in southeast Missouri. Right. But you, it's it's our it's our responsibility to find out where we're going to hunt the laws in that area. Are there laws against going in the night before and beating all of these locals to this spot and putting my spread out and hanging a lantern on a tree po- a tree to make it look like somebody's out there because I've faced that on the Snake River the tr- you know the rivers sure. out here where I pull up and you s- there's nobody there but there's a light on there with the spread set already or is that different in every state and is it illegal or legal the I know on f- every federal refuge I've ever looked you know at the rules on the, let's go with opening day. Opening day is opening day, okay? So you can't get out there until that calendar day. But at 12.01 a.m., unless there's a, you know, unless it's like a California refuge where you have to go through the draw and everything, you know, to, you, you know, you got a number, um, you have to go through the lottery. Uh, but but let's say it's not there. It's someplace else, you know, like in Nevada. I mean, I've seen guys going out at midnight, you know, and they just try to camp out there with the mosquitoes. That never works out too well. <laughs> and then, you know, they're there first thing in the morning. That's legal and on the federal properties that we hunt around here anyway, as long as they don't get out there before the day of the, you know, the opening day, because it just says opening day of waterfowl season. So opening day starts 12.01 a.m., right? Um, uh, and but some places are you can't be on the water until 4:30 or 5 or 5:30. There's a several places I've hunted in Arkansas where there was a limit to how early you could go. Actually, most of the timber places, the by meat is a perfect example. Um, you know, it's it's regulated. I mean, they got the starting line there, and when they yeah. drop the flag, they're gone. Yeah. You know, but but that's fine. That's the way those guys hunt, and they like it, and it's kind of exciting when you do it. You know, um, so it it, it it's. It's really, really important, and this was your point, that you read the regulations for wherever you're hunting. You can read the state regulations, and that has nothing to do with hunting on this federal refuge in that state because the federal regs are different than the state regs in almost all cases. You know, the boating regs are different. They Horsepower limits and that kind of thing will be different from what the state allows over here on this, you know, state-owned land or whatever it is. So, um and most of our waters are small out here, so, you know, the, the horsepower limits are pretty small, and, and you don't need big motors. You just need mud motors so you can get around in shallow water, you know. Uh, but, but yeah, that that's the biggest thing, I think, is probably the, the boating aspect of it is the easiest way to get a ticket. Um, you know, that uh, there, there are a few. I've hunted in California in places where they have the 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 area you drew marked there's a stake out there with a number on it or whatever you know and you have to hunt within a certain distance of that stake you have no choice right which is okay because then people don't end up on top of each other which is why they did that in the first place right you know to stop the the you know the the confrontations that occur and um uh, so that's fine, but most places don't have that. And, you know, you just work it out and you hope the guy doesn't set up downwind of you and shoot every bunch of birds that's coming into your decoys, <laughs> which is happened sure to me I too. I want to make sure I have it right what you said. You said opening day 1201. So if it's the third week of the season, can I leave my decoys out overnight on public property? You can't on the public ref- – the federal refuges for sure you can't. Um, and – you know, state lands, I, I – the ones I've hunted, I know that it specifically says you can't You do can't. That. Yeah. Okay, and, so what if it's – answer the, to the best of your knowledge, Dave. Can you – if I'm a farmer and I own a cornfield on the front range of Colorado, and I've seen people out there that they do what they call chum, right? They put two decoys out there to where the geese in the air go, oh, that looks good. And the, the, by the third day, it's full of lessers or whatever. Right. 
are there federal rules that would make that illegal too that says that you cannot keep a spread out on your even though you own that property do the federal waterfowl laws because the limits do and different things apply to the private property yep. do laws like that apply to private property too to where I can't leave a spread out on my private pond or my I don't believe bill? I've never read that anywhere you've never read now, that now that doesn't mean it isn't doesn't exist but I, I have never read that you can't leave your own well think about the, the rice think fields about in the California right? in, in California in the rice lands they put those decoys out in September and they might get around to picking them up in February. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, and so that's totally legal, obviously, in that state and on private land. Um, and and most things are legal on private land. You know, I mean that, that's uh, yeah it, within reason, obviously. Um, but but I don't I don't think there's a I can't think of a single place I've ever hunted, and I've hunted a few places where there was any issue with you leaving your spread out if you wanted to. So when we transition into the season now, what is the first thing that we need to be aware of as opening day is over now and the ducks are there? But now you said this was very important what you said. The the deck is reshuffled. Okay, the dealer's standing there and she goes, okay, now (laughs) let's see what you got. Now you really have to put your skill set to work now. You do. What do you do? Do you do you go what time? Okay, let's 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 limit this. To what we would call a quote, and I hate the word, I shouldn't even use weekend warrior because some people just can only hunt on the weekend. I understand. You know, because they got a five day a week job and that's normal. That's awesome. But weekend hunters, they know that those are the only two days of the week they can hunt. They're going no matter what. It could be 80 degrees, they're going. It makes no difference. So what do we do if we can't get out and scout that week? Do we try to use everything in our advantage with the moon phase, the weather report, all of that Mm -hmm. on timing? And I want you to end this question and your answer by talking about, is there a certain time of the day that you should, you know, focus in on? Because we, me and you love to hunt mallards and my favorite is like 10 to 2 or 11 to 1, somewhere in there. But to talk to me a little bit about if I'm a, a guy that works five days a week or a mom that works five days a week and I know I'm going hunting with my son and daughter or nephew, whatever, this weekend, and I can't get out there during the week. Right, because so, you've been in that position, I'm sure. Oh, you're sure. hunting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How you do you know, how for, do you how do you work that in? So I think what you do in that situation is then then it becomes, you know, you, you've got some. Most people have some buddies that they hunt with in this situation you're talking about, where they're, for lack of a better term, the weekend warriors. They're hunting the same public area or public areas might be, you know, a whole bunch of them around where they live. But, but you know, they're familiar with them because that's where they hunt all the time. And, um, and that's great. Um, but if so, the first thing I would say is if you've got some buddies, you know, who hunt that same area and are going to be there too, regardless, then if somebody can take off a work early on Friday and at least watch the birds go in that evening, you know, if you don't have the opportunity to get there, that's, that's one good way to do it. Um, and the other is, you know, you, you, is, is what you're talking about earlier. You know, you look at the wind, you look at the clouds, you look at all of those things that you have no control over, Right. And you make your best guess best based on that. I mean, you've got all these waypoints marked in your phone or however you keep track of where you're going to go in the dark. And, uh, you know, and, and you look at that and you think, man, that little Thule Island on the backside of that lake is going to be perfect for this wind, you know, and that's where you go. And, and that's, you know, that's the best you can do um, in, in those situations. Um, but, but if you do hunt with buddies, typically – Unless it's just a long ways to where you hunt, you know, like hours away, many hours away, um, you know, somebody, you know, you can alternate it to where maybe somebody takes a half a day off every Friday. You know, if you got three buddies or something, that doesn't that doesn't kill you in the long run. Um, uh, but anyway, that's one way to do it. You know, otherwise, you're going to have to go with the the information you've had from years of hunting there and just give it your best shot based on the the weather conditions you know i mean i think people look at the weather and go oh the wind's going to blow this will be perfect well it's only perfect if you're in the right spot you know we've both been in the wrong spot on windy days watching the birds go (laughs) to wherever they go and had to pick up all of that stuff and go go to where the birds are or somebody else may already be there and then you just get to watch them shoot birds (laughs) you know so you don't want to be that guy if you can avoid it but it's going to happen to all of us anyway I, i think that's where the if you can apply hunting you know on 
wildlife area A to area B, C, and D, you know, there's some things that are the same regardless of where you are. The ducks, the ducks do some things the same everywhere they are, right? I mean, everywhere they, they like to be that time of year. So um, you've just got to take advantage of, of the things you know will happen. And, and you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's really hard when you can't go out there and just, you know, I mean, my, my ideal scouting um, for our western wetlands out here is, you know, you go out Friday or whatever day, it doesn't make any difference, but Friday would be true for most people. You go out in the middle of the day and it's amazing how many birds are flying around from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock when no one's out there. Same thing on Saturday. The same birds are doing the same thing they were doing on Friday, even though they've been getting shot at. Those birds weren't because they weren't flying around then, you know. Um, obviously, boats and disturb them and kick them up and do all of that. So you have to take that. If you're looking at them on open water, they're not going to be there after the first boat goes across there, right? You know, so um, one of the things that you want to keep in mind about your spots is, yes, you can hunt open water, certainly. You just don't want to be where every boat comes out of the landing, you know, and goes across in front of your spread to get to wherever they're going. Um, you know, you want to be... You well, that brings up a great point right there because I was going to ask this because you go back to private property and you know that the sun's coming out at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. and it's going to be blue skies and the wind's going to start blowing, you can say, I'm going out then. Nobody's going to be there. It's my land. Right. But in public property, the mindset is, I got to get there first. Mm -hmm. So then you start thinking about ethics again or etiquette of like, well, if I don't get there in, at dark, is it okay for me to take off at 8 a.m. when these guys are already set up and they've been there for a couple hours already? Because... I would think that what you just said would give me the mindset of, I don't have to be there. I'm going to wait until some people come out of there and maybe they'll kill them. Maybe they don't. But I, should we give people the idea of, Hey, don't get in such a rush all the time. I've always said like, Hey yeah. man, I like seeing the majesty of ducks. I like the sun being up oh, and, yeah. you know, killing them in the dark is cool and introducing people to it is awesome. But what would you say to that as far as, like, do we have to be in a hurry to be out there before the sun comes up every time? So out, you know, out here where we hunt, we do get some pretty good winds sometimes, you know. And the only thing I know for sure about wind is you want to be there before it starts because the first couple hours of the wind are when you're going to kill the birds. After it's blown and blown and blown, the birds get to where they want to be and they're not moving unless you go kick them up, you know, and they're going to be in sheltered tule ponds and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, yeah, if, uh, and this happens a lot um, for, for me during the season. I mean, I look at the weather report and, you know, I always get a little antsy because it's Saturday morning and I'm sitting there in my cabin <laughs> not going hunting and it's 8 o'clock or something. And, but I know the wind's not going to blow till 11 o'clock. You know, I mean, every single wind thing that I look at, and I got three or four of them, so I can kind of get a good average, you know, says 11 o'clock. So I'm going to be out there at 10 for sure, so I can get set up and everything. But, um, but yeah, uh, the, the, the beauty of that is you don't have the frustration of going to a spot and somebody's already there. You can see they're there. Just go to another spot, you know. Um, and if you wait around till 10 o'clock, most of those spots on public land are empty. I mean, at least out here, you know, they are. You know, guys hunt the early hunt, um, you know, from, from half hour before till, you know, 8 or 9 o'clock, and they're gone, you know, and they're not coming back either. So keep that in mind. The afternoon shoot um, on, on a lot of our public land here in Nevada uh, is way less, um, uh, what do you call it? Pressure? Uh, yeah, way less pressure than, than the morning hunt. But the best duck hunter I know, um, he is a guy who is going to be on the X nine times out of ten. It's because he spends a lot of time watching the ducks with his binoculars. And, and, and you know, his deal is he loves to put out a ton of decoys, but he could kill them with five decoys the way he hunts, you know. Um, and, and it's... It's because he spends the time, he knows where they're going to go, what they're going to do. Um, he's, he's always out there before the wind blows, and he loves, literally loves to hunt from 10 to 2. Loves it. The best. And, he, and he'll stay till quitting time, obviously, but seldom, seldom is in the marsh before 10 o'clock. Any day. I like, I like what you're saying because this is what, what I've kind of transitioned to is that my scouting a lot of the time takes place the day of the hunt. 
And I know that that's kind of what you're touching on is that if you do, if you get there after the sun's up and you take your time, because here's the mindset, we got to get there. We want to kill a limit. Well, here's the deal. Whether you kill a limit or not, a limit can take 40 minutes. It can take 15 minutes sometime if you want to kill True. teal. So we don't have to always be in this rush mindset of like, we got to get in there and then stay all day. If you take your time and spend some of that time that you would be, you know, setting up in the wrong spot, you might be able to go in there on Saturday and go, whoa, whoa. Look at the mallards pitching in right there and then put your binoculars up and be like, there's nobody over there and those ducks are going to attract more ducks. This wind's perfect for it. That's where I'm going today. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of the scouting takes place on the day of the actual hunt, right? Yeah, absolutely. Once the season's going, absolutely. And and you you go out there with a plan. You know, you've got a plan in mind, but you got to be... Unless there's going to be a big wind or something, you have to be totally flexible, you know, because the ducks are going to go where they want to go, not where you want them to go <laughs> necessarily. And, you, you know, you, you just have to you have to figure out what everybody else is doing. Um, we're lucky, uh, you know, and after the first couple weeks of the season, there's not a whole lot of pressure on on some of our public wetlands here in Nevada because there's not a whole lot of duck hunters, you know. Um, in California, where, you, where all the public land is is done by lottery, you know, it's that's a different deal. There's going to be guys there every single day, every single hunt, probably morning and evening. Um, uh, but 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 a lot of the West certainly and and uh, and other places I've hunted. This is true in the South as well. Um, you know, you can that middle of the day and and evening time hunt can be great. Y you have to temper that with, um, you know, when you shoot at those birds that they have some place to go. You know, else somewhere else to go that they'll go to and and get whatever they want. We're coming there for, and you know, will they come back? Um, you know, I know that's why that <clears throat> there's rules in, well, like Arkansas. You know, you got to be out of the timber by noon, I think, or eleven o'clock, or well, it depends on where you are, I guess. Some of the clubs, it's ten o'clock. Yep. You know, they just most of them are ten. They, they hunt till ten. And you have to physically be out of there by 11. I mean, you got a boat on the trailer or back to the dock, whatever situation setup they have. And, and I understand that, you know, perfectly. Um, but for that's not the weekend warrior's experience, yeah. you know. I mean, sometimes you end up in that spot, and that's great. But most of the time, you know, we're in it for the day. And, and I, like you, have seen enough sunrises and I want to see every other one I can for the rest of my life. And when I have my grandkids, man, I'm there at the crack. They're out there in the dark eating granola bars and doing all the stuff their moms don't know they get to do when we go duck hunting. Of course. And, you know, they're having a big time and, and because that's part of it. My dad took me. You know, I can remember walking out behind him into the, into the marsh when I was a little guy. I mean, seven years old maybe and maybe younger than that. And... Uh, um, you know, and he'd sit me on a spot and say, okay, you sit here, you know, and he'd walk off a little ways and shoot some ducks when it got light enough or whatever. And, and that, that's a, that's a, that's a part of it that, that you grow out of, honestly, uh, you know, and that, and that's not a bad thing that you grow out of it. It's great that you got to experience it enough that you grow out of it. Some guys never grow out of it. Some guys have to be there on the opening bell, you know, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. No. It's just... Under a lot of conditions, like here, you know, in the, in certainly in Nevada and in the West in general, not California, but the West that gets cold, um, you know, in December and January, there's really no reason to go duck hunting early in the morning. They're not flying. The water's frozen. That's and, when we start talking about what we call the thaw, right? Right, exactly. And so, you know, that that changes the game. And and you can get those freezes in October or November. They're certainly more prevalent in December and January, you know, and sometimes they stay for a lot longer, the ice does. And, and eventually it gets too thick and the birds leave and then you got to go find some other place to to hunt. But um but yeah, it's you know, that's that's the the gist of that is that you you need to you, need, you know, you need to go with a plan, but it needs to be super flexible. You know, I mean, and, and the more times you see it happen where you went thinking you were going to do something and you did something totally different and it was successful, will make it a whole lot easier. Those times happen when you don't go out at dawn because you don't get to see the birds flying around except right in your local area. You know, and and that's that's something that's th this guy was talking about. That's I think the best duck hunter I've ever known. He um. He spends all of his time when he's out there hunting. Scouting. 
with his binoculars. I was just going to go it. into that. It's amazing never how takes my them mind. off. You taught you, me that a long time ago. You never see that guy without his binoculars on. I don't care. I mean, I don't care how fast the mallards are flying in or whatever. He wants to see where he's going to go tomorrow. How you know? smart is that, though? You That's taught me that a brilliant. long time ago that you're scouting. Yeah. I was going to go into that next. Is, and then, you know, scouting the day of the hunt. Now you're scouting during the hunt. Right. Because there's why two not? reasons why, right? One is if it's not working, our mindset is, man, we've done all this work. I don't want to trudge through more <laughs> right. mud. Well, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit here and then go home with no food? Right. Right? Yeah. I'm not saying it's not great being out there, but there is that part of us that wants to pull the trigger once in a while, too. So now you're scouting during the hunt. I'm like, oh, wow, they're pitching in over there. Well, why are they pitching in over there? There's got to be some reason. Well, they might have found some food there yesterday. There might be better shelter there. There might be a better wind block there. There might be better uh, current there that's mixing it up a little bit more mm-hmm. for them. Ducks think, you know, you got to start thinking like a duck. So <clears throat> now it's like, well, I'm not getting any shooting here. So I just scouted my spot for the for the next two hours. I'm going to get over there I'm because, again, it might only take you, if you're there, you might be done in an hour once you're set up. Sure. So you might have to take another hour to get over there and set up. Mm-hmm. And then you're talking about your friend that's scouting for tomorrow. You're like, man, I'm, you know, I'm getting them today pretty good, but look at what's going on over there. Sure. And that's, and a, that's a great mind. That's a great point. And when over there is only like a half a mile away or something, you know, which is for most places you hunt ducks, not so much in Nevada because it's so flat, but, you know, that's about as far as you can see them working, right? You know, mm-hmm. and, and maybe that's not completely accurate, but, um, but if it's just, you know, a half a mile or so, I mean, it's worth taking the walk over there and... Or, or if you got to take a boat, you know, motoring over and then maybe rowing into the spot so you don't just totally blow them out. But and look and see why they're there, you know. And, and kicking them up's not a bad thing no. because typically if you don't shoot at them, some of them are going to come back, you know, because they were there for a reason to start with. Um, and so you know you might you might kick them out when you go over to kind of scope it out. But the the other thing, doing it the other way where you just pick up everything and, and head over there. Um, you know, sometimes you get to there and you realize they're standing on a half inch of, you know, water on a mud flat, and there's no way you can get to where the ducks are. I mean, Great it's not point. possible Great with the equipment point. you have, yeah, right? So, now that so tomorrow you, know. you bring your sleds or your layout deals, you know, that you can with the uh, neo tubs, and man, you're laying in that mud and you don't give a damn. Maybe some more full body <laughs> decoys. Maybe yep. not as many floaters. Certainly, because yeah, floater isn't going to do any good in a half inch of water. I mean, other than sticking a keel down in the mud. So, um, yeah, and and and, that, and that's happened to me. That's why I know that. So now I've picked up. I got my boat full of all this stuff. It took me 45 minutes to put out the first time. I come around the corner and realize they're standing out in the middle of a mud flat. 200 yards Whoops. from the nearest cover and they're all flying in over water and landing so there's no way to get a shot at them right yeah. you know, well <laughs> that wasn't very smart <laughs> now if you know you're seeing them going in a mile or more away and there's enough ducks to interest you then yeah it's probably worth just picking up and going but uh, you know so you're not spending an extra hour going back and forth but but if you can check it out first it's that's a good idea. <laughs> when you start getting down to, you know, transitioning now into scouting live birds, okay, there's a difference in scouting live birds. And what I mean by that, Dave, is what we just talked about was you see in birds pitching from a half mile away, but the landscape, there's, not, there's nothing that's going to give you the vantage point to see what you just said. Okay, they're all full mm-hmm. bodied, standing in a half inch of water. If you can, though, let's say that you, you're in a situation to where you're on top of them and you can, how much importance do you put on realism now in your preparation for tomorrow's hunt? Meaning, the, you just mentioned that the best duck hunter in the world that you know loves to put out a lot of decoys. What are you going to try to emulate the next day to get them to think that they're that you're what they saw today when the live ducks are in there. How many decoys? How do you place your decoys? We've heard the J-hook. We've heard the W. We've mm-hmm. heard the X. And then you start talking jerk strings and current and moving of water. How do you how do you game plan that? Do you want to look exactly like what you're looking at in the in the real thing? Yeah, I mean, I think if it's a situation where you can sneak up on them a little and, and you know, take a shot with your phone or something so, so that, you know, because your memory isn't always exactly that right, but you look at that picture or a couple of pictures and you can go, okay, well, they were... Certainly more concentrated over here than they were over here. But the most important factor, I think, when you find a spot like that is how are you going to hide? Because it doesn't matter if you're on the X. If they can see you on the X, they're not coming to the X. You know, yep. They're going to Y over there too far to shoot at. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's the first 
you know, once you pick the spot, that's the first consideration is, you know, how are we going to hide in this spot? If you got, you know, Thule Islands and stuff, you can run your boat up in them. Or if you got a boat blind, just pull up against it and pull your boat blind up. And that's typically good enough, you know, um, and great cover, great way to hide. Um, if it's a mud flat or something, then, you know, you're going to get out of the boat and you're going to be, you're going to be laying in the mud in some fashion. Um, uh, or, you know, hopefully they're close enough to a shoreline that, you know, you can just lay on the shoreline or sit on the shoreline with your legs in the water or whatever. Um, rivers rivers tend to be like that a lot where you find the birds because it's going to be some kind of little shallow deal where they're hanging out, right? And But you got a bank there or an island or, or something where you can hide in most cases. They're not vast flats, um, at least in the rivers that, that we hunt out here. And um, so you can, you know, if you can use the bank cover, you got it made. Assuming there is some bank cover, but um, but if you have to if you have to camouflage yourself, your boat, your however you're going to do it, you're blind. Um, then you need to give a great deal of thought to that. And and that day, so you found this a little late in the day. It's certainly worth cutting all the brush and everything. Then you know it's just one thing you don't have to do tomorrow. You're already there, right? Your day shot. You know, I mean, you found the spot you want to be tomorrow. So. Let's get ready for tomorrow. And that's hard to do sometimes. I mean, a lot of guys will put the decoys out and just sit there all afternoon thinking, well, maybe I'll get a shot at one. Whereas you could have done a couple hours worth of preparation and make tomorrow a breeze, you know. Perfect. Just yeah. cutting tamarisk trees and sticking them in the mud. And before you know it, you got a little tamarisk grove there and you're sitting in the middle of it. You know, like they do in, uh, well, you've seen them in Canada where, you know, they have this wire blinds. And I mean, they're literally evergreen. <laughs> You know, on the things, they don't look like anything anywhere near there. And that birds, they kill. They, they can't kill see you. They can't birds see like crazy yeah. out of those things. You know. So, anyway, it's and, and that's another thing that that we should we should talk about is that the hunting birds on water is one thing, and we're talking mostly about ducks here. Um, when you're hunting birds on agriculture, that's a whole different ball game. Okay, and and typically, if I'm hunting them on agriculture. I don't want people to be hunting them on water, okay? Because that changes what they do if they hunt them on water. And like, and that's kind of handy in Canada, you know, at least the parts of Canada I've hunted. Most people don't hunt the water except, Very few. except on DU projects or something specifically set up for that. Um, and there's a lot of weird regulations too, you know, and like in Saskatchewan, there's a certain size body of water you can't hunt and, you know, you can and whatever. And anyway, um, so if you're hunting agricultural fields, it's, uh, you know, and you're in the middle of Alberta, let's say, you know, I mean, there's, there's miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of wheat and peas and canola, which doesn't really do you any good, but you got to be able to identify canola because you don't want to be, don't want to wake up one morning in a canola field. Um, you know, and so the point is that it's a little different in that uh, farmland scouting, you know, you want to find the birds where they're going in. And preferably, you want to see them go in there twice. I mean, you know, if you really want to, you know, I mean, you can always go and ask for permission and say, hey, I'm either going to hunt it today or tomorrow, knowing you're not going to hunt it today, um, you know, or the next two days. Most most farmers are happy to do that. I mean, they really are in, in Canada anyway. I mean, they're the most agreeable people with their private land I've ever met in my life, yeah, anywhere, anytime, sure. just wonderful people. And, and it doesn't mean that it's easy hunting. It, it, it can be certainly. Um, but, but scouting there is a completely different deal. You know, I mean, you're, you're looking for clouds of birds is what you're looking for, you know? Um, and, and I have, I found them. Sometimes it takes two or three days to find them, but I'll see them lift off, of the body of, you know, a big lake we have close by or something, right? I'll see them lift off every morning and they're headed that way. So I'm going down the roads and most of the roads are in 90 degree angles. You know, they're laid out in squares in, in farmland Canada. And so I'll go as far as I can until I lose them because they're going faster than I can go, you know, by the time I make all the turns and stuff to keep up with them. So I'll get to that point. So the next morning I'll be at that point 15 minutes earlier when they come over and I got to, you know, because sometimes they fly 15 or 20 miles. Sometimes they go, you know, 150 yards. Yeah. You, you just, you have to watch them to see what they do. But I have found some spectacular hunts by chasing them with a car, <laughs> you know, and then just, 
they end up and you meet some new farmer that you didn't even know he was there, you know, and they're they're in his peas this year because he's harvested them and there's plenty of spill crop and our waste crop and and uh, you know that's home run. <laughs> Time to go. Same, it's the same thing on you know when you start talking about dry land is. You, you, you want to be as close to where you see them. You know, when I've talked scouting there before is a lot of times we would go in and we'd see, all right, well, they're there. But is that really where they came into the field? Mm-hmm. Where are they approaching from? Are they landing up higher and walking down into this place that you saw them to where if you set up in a low ravine part of the field, they might not want to approach that part. They might think there's a boogeyman in there. They might not feel as safe. Sure. It's not natural to them. So there's a lot of things that go in when you start to scout Canada geese for specks or mallards in, right. in dry land is like, well, they're there. I'm going to go find option B. Well, if I know option A is what I want to go with because there was a lot more mallards or Canada's in there, I'm going to go back and put those birds to bed. Right. I want to go in there and see, one, are they still there? Did a coyote or a hawk scare them out of there? And they've already transitioned into another field mm-hmm. where they might go to this new field tomorrow. So you start talking about like where your mindset of public area, private property, but it doesn't matter. This is dry land now. There's rules to scouting agriculture what you call it, dry land mallards or whatever right. you got, there's a lot of particulars that you want to have in place for that as well absolutely and there spotting scopes really handy because it's typically flat land or at least flat enough you can use that kind of magnification obviously you're going to take your binoculars but um yeah it's and and honestly i've gotten messed up more times you know because the, the land's flat quote unquote flat but it's rolling hills at least where i hunt most of the time in alberta it is and so you'll look at it and you'll see the birds going in there in the afternoon and you watch the next day and sure enough they're going in in the morning but in a little different spot and then so you go around to the other side of the field and look and because the way the sun comes up there's a big giant shadow on this side of a little rise right that they just don't like that for whatever reason They'll land 200 yards over there in the afternoon. They'll land right on that spot because there's no shadow there anymore. Great point. You know, and and so that it just if you can, particularly in those fields, typically the roads follow the edge of the fields. You know, so you can just you can drive all the way around them, most of them, or at least close. You can get around two or three sides on virtually any field I've ever hunted there, and usually you can drive all four sides. If you can do that, it's a good idea to do that. And and. You know, not everybody has the luxury of being there as many days as you want to be there, you know, and I get that. And so people want to hunt every day they're there. That's fine. So when you start your scouting on your hunt up, you know, you you and your buddies go to Canada or whatever you're doing, you know, you, you scout that first day, you find a spot to hunt. Great. Okay. So we got this spot. You go out and you need to just build a little catalog. So you're, you're always a couple of hunts ahead. Which means somebody in the group has to go check on all of those, you know, and that's what we do. You know, it's uh, Ooh, I'm going like to bail at three o'clock. Yeah, I'm like going to bail at three o'clock, and I'm going to go watch those other three. I'm going to go hit those three spots, whichever one has the most birds. I'm going to watch it, and that's where we're going to hunt in the morning because you already have permission. And they might be they might be thirty miles apart each. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's you, a lot of you, you burn be up some tires and gas in Canada. But here's, I, I want you to keep talking on this, but when we start talking about the Canadian borders opening again, and you got your main ones like you have Alberta, you have Saskatchewan, you have Ontario, and you have Manitoba. Those are the four main, and I would say Correct. Alberta and Saskatchewan are the biggest for our for Americans going up there. Um, it is uh, sc- the, 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 the public proper public land ideology is what you have to have because you really are scouting up there. You're scouting a lot of places that you can't hunt. It's owned by somebody. But like mm-hmm. you said, they're very, you know, they're very nice about letting you hunt up there. They are. There's, you know, the Queensland, there's all the things that you can learn about it if you study Canada and the provinces. But you, your technique in scouting should be the same as scouting public property down in the States. A lot of it, right? You're going to have to knock on a door. Yes. You're going to get permission. You're going to have plot maps with the farmer's name and maybe a phone number on there. Mm-hmm. You might go to the local pub or the cafe and meet a lot of those farmers during the day. Yep. But uh, which brings up another great part of scouting, which you touched on the very beginning of this, is networking. Having some friends that do it. But also getting that early season in Canada. I know that w- people go around in the off season and help them farm. They help them combine. They go and have barbecues, and, and this is all good ideas in your local area down in the states too to keep in mind. Of I'm going to go Absolutely. get to know these farmers. I'm going to go help them during the summer. I'm going to go meet them at the local bake sale. I'm going to go to the local high school basketball game and meet these guys and get to know them. It makes everything easier as networking. But it you're does. talking about Canada specifically. It's a it's it's a great idea, I think, to think that 
it is like scouting down in the United States a lot. You know, the mm-hmm. you know driving around and 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 actually applying these techniques to it. You're, that's true. It's just that you're more apt to find a mother load of birds you didn't know were there yeah, in 100%. Canada just because they just keep coming, right? Just, I mean, yeah. you're you're there at the end of September, the first two or three weeks of October, man. The deck gets shuffled every single day, and not because of hunters, but because they're still coming and coming and coming, you know, and in good years. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, – yeah, so so that that keeps you on your toes. You know, place you've looked at for a week straight and hadn't been a bird on it, and you go back there, or you see a guy in the cafe a couple weeks later, and he tells you you just smoked him on that guy's property, and you're going, what? yeah, I forgot to go over there and check and see if the birds had found it yet. You know, so you have to places that I've been going there a long time now. So there's places I'm going to go check if there hasn't. I'm going to check it every day. You know, every day that I'm scouting because I know at some point the birds are going to find it. You know, if it's got either peas or wheat in it, um, and they're going to be there. And, and when they do, I'm going to ask the guy, and I'm going to get the permission to hunt it because I'm going to see them go in there when they're first going in and then let them go in there for a few days, you know. Uh, I mean, that's what those are the best hunts I find, honestly, are, are from, you know, places I know of that are, you know, you can't see them from the highway, obviously. And uh, um, you, you've got you to go off the beaten path to, to look for them a little bit. And and but it's amazing how often that those birds will come back to the same fields. And there's thousands of acres of that same crop around them, right? And even if they're going to the neighbor who won't let you hunt, there's the whole trafficking thing too. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you're if you've got the decoys to do it, you can, you know, you can scratch out great hunts not being on the X in Canada. It's one of the few places that. You know, I would say you can. Which brings up another great point of scouting. Not on the X. Now, here's another great point of scouting, though, is how can you get in between using etiquette again, Mm -hmm. the roost and the X? And now you're scouting somewhere where there's not even any birds, but now you're visualizing your hunt of being able to cut them off. Trafficking to people that are wondering what Dave means is you're running traffic. The birds are going to fly over that area to get to where they want to go, and you're trying to persuade them to and cut them short of where they're going to go. Sure. And and I I find that it's harder to do with ducks than any other waterfowl, you know, trafficking them, you know, uh, trying to cut them off before where they're going because ducks ducks move fast they eat fast and they go back fast right they do everything fast over dry land um, because it's not their preferred habitat so you know I mean you, you think about how they come into decoys over water versus how they come into decoys on dry land they it's a lot it happens a lot faster on reckless dry land. Have been. yeah and and so the ducks I've, I've had some just blind luck um, you know getting them to come in to a field they weren't working but but so i I typically am going to try to get the geese and but for that reason i don't mess with the duck decoys or anything i just put goose decoys out ducks will come into goose decoys anywhere in canada um that i've ever hunted and uh um, you know specs are probably you know i don't want to say they're easy but you know in the order of you know how hard they are to kill i'd say it's specs little honkers and and then snows and and then if they haven't been shot at the big honkers are actually you know like park geese i mean they're pretty dumb they're, yeah. they would actually be first in line but i don't usually hunt them early in september just because i don't want to eat them yeah, they're, poor <laughs> so, they're just you know, big old things um but uh anyway the uh, and the snows are just a problem because of the numbers you know i mean it's just if you can find a field that's got three or four or five thousand snow geese in it and they're coming in 50 at a time touchdown <laughs> yeah. And that's another thing about what you're saying about how the duck deck gets shuffled up north when you start going up there is that when the snows migrate, that can really change things up oh, and how yeah. the Canadas react, how the mallards act. I mean, things start gotta, acting different when the snows are around, right? Yeah, you need to have white decoys in your spread. Don't have to have a thousand of them or 500 of them or whatever, but you, every big, large group of waterfowl you see has white birds in it, you know, from 50 to to the thousands or whatever, exactly. but, but they're there and those birds see them. Plus they can see those white decoys from way farther away than the other ones, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, it's the goose hunting is a completely different deal in some ways and exactly the same in others. But, but I, I think you're, you, the one thing you can do with geese reliably that you can't necessarily do with ducks is, is, is get in their, their flight path from their roost to their feeding field and get some of them to change their mind about where they're going to go, 
you know. I exactly. Mean, and it doesn't work every day. I mean, I've, I've done that and pulled the big zero before, for sure. But I've also had some, you know, pretty phenomenal hunts and ducks coming out of nowhere. Didn't even know there were any ducks around, you know. And yeah, you just so. mentioned how I wanted, how I was going to end this, and I wanted to transition into it anyway, is that when you start talking about detailed scouting, you just mentioned snows and white and how birds react to it. So I want you to end this by your detailed scouting of species now, because this starts to play a role in what you've taught me of how many mallards you've killed over some canvas back decoys because of the visibility, swan decoys because of the visibility. Mm -hmm. So when you're scouting out there and you see a couple ring necks with white on their back or some cans floating around or some sprig with white on them, there's a reason why there's mallards going in there. Then the other part of it is you've taught me about coots. If you see some coots swimming, it might not be a good idea to, to, to get your decoy spread scouted out just like what you're seeing out there because there's a reason why those puddle ducks are being comfortable. I'm not saying, you know, you mentioned before that you saw a bunch of ducks out there but you didn't have any binoculars. They might all be ringnecks, right? But if you yep. look out there and you see a bunch of mallards bombing in and you see some sprig or some canvasbacks or a swan or some coots swimming around, would you tell the duck hunter, the weekend warrior, whoever it is, hey, don't be afraid to mix up your spread and, and scout specifically to species? Yeah. I, I mean, particularly if they care what species they hunt, you know. Some, some people, they, they want to shoot their birds, you know, and, and, and they're, it's legal to do that. That's not a problem. And they're not species specific in any fashion they don't care um but some people do you know i mean i know guys that go out and you can only shoot two cans but they go out and hunt canvasbacks every day and or every day they hunt and you know they're going to shoot two bull cans and go home if they get the chance um and then other people you know out here we're lucky with the mallard limit we can kill seven and um you know you're going to stay a while longer to kill seven most times but <laughs> that's nothing wrong with that yeah. you know um anyway that that is uh, I forgot where we were going with that. Well, I was just saying is with when you're scouting and you said how birds react to snows, you want to have oh, snow right. use decoys in there. Do you would you tell a guy, hey, if you're going to go hunt mallards out there and you see some sprig or you see some cans with white on them, would you tell a guy, you know, scout specifically? Like I'm not saying like, oh, there's mallards going there. I'm specifically going to go, you know, target those mallards. But mm -hmm. would you tell a guy, hey, if you're seeing some white out there if, through your scouting methods, don't be afraid to mix your decoy spread up Correct. and have some white in there. Right. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. No, you're there. good. But um, yes, that and that works very well. And and there's obvious places like little tule holes, you know, that are 50 feet across that you don't want to put swans and canvasbacks in because they won't be in there. Right. right. They can't get out of there. They've got to run to take off. Yeah. And uh, um, but but when you see them, and and this typically happens in really good. In, in, at least where we hunt, you know, in areas where you have good aquatic vegetation, sago or whatever it is, and the swans, the widgeon, the canvasbacks, the, the, all of the diver species, and most of the puddle duck species will all be together in some fashion, you know. I mean, they'll, they'll all be in the same area eating. So absolutely, when you set up on the edge of water like that, whether it's big open water or smaller water, um, it, it, you know, mixing up the species is a good thing. And, and when we get ice, you know, so that uh, perfect ice for those of you who haven't hunted in ice or think that's probably not a good idea <laughs> is when it freezes at night and you get about a half an inch of ice, maybe three quarters of an inch, and then you get a, you have a clear sunny day the next day. And by about 10 o'clock, that starts getting soft. And by one o'clock, it's opening up. You know, that, that ice is melted off for that day, and the ducks know it. And, you know, you're going to kill all your birds the first couple hours in the afternoon, and then it's going to start freezing up again. You know, so that is, um, you know, that's, that's another one of those things that you have to, you know, you have to be aware of that, that that's going to affect it. But, but once we get to cold weather, I hardly ever hunt out here without a couple of swan decoys because that takes the place of dozens of decoys as far as visibility goes. Right. Right. Now, if everybody is using them, then I'm not going to necessarily do that. I'll take some cans or something else. But white is important. The, the example you gave is very important that, you know, when you look out across that pond or lake or this little slough you found or whatever, and a bunch of those birds have white on them. Well, you know, the, those mallards see that if that's what you want to hunt and and they're not afraid of it. You know, and even though they don't look like mallards, they look like ducks to them. And so they will they will definitely come in. Yeah. I love it.
there's so much like you could talk about scouting forever because it's kind of a sure and everybody a, does it different you know and then i learn something from people all the time um but but i'll tell you you know google earth or some on x type thing on your phone a good pair of binoculars and then if you hunt the open farmland a spotting scope you take those things and and a pair of boots you're not afraid to wear out then you know you're going to do okay i want to say this too because i get this question a lot is drones and the evolution of aerial scouting with Mm -hmm. You know, there's been laws for years of scouting big game out of airplanes or parachute planes, or now we have these drones that you can fly two miles away, go over a field, and oh man, look at those gobblers in there. There's rules and regulations to this, especially when it comes to federal migratory waterfowl. There's rules of flying a drone over live ducks and geese. Yeah. I think that it's smart to tell people. Don't Make sure that you don't do it. And if you want to and you think that we're wrong, go talk to a game warden or the law enforcement of your local DNR, Department of Wildlife, Department of Natural Resources, and find out the federal laws and the state laws on flying drones to scout waterfowl. And that's the key is go to talk to that state warden, you know, at the DNR. And then make sure you go and talk to a federal warden because the rules, we talked about that earlier, are not the same not the necessarily. Same. And, yeah, drones are, you know, that's not my favorite thing. You know, I mean, I, I think we, can get, we can get too good at this, okay, yeah. and take all the mystery out of it. And do you really want to do that? No. Is it duck hunting then? No. No, it's just killing. So, no. you know, you, you, you got to have a little mystery left. <laughs> you know, and yeah, the cell phones with the maps and everything, that's one thing. I get it. Um, you know, but, uh, yeah, I, I, have never used one for that purpose and, and I don't, I'm not sure I know anybody that has, but I'm sure people do because they're available to do it yeah. and there are places they can't easily get to. So, and particularly if you can't see, like there's trees, you know, and you're just looking to see if they're in that hole in the, you know, the slough way over there and you fly the thing over and look at it, you know, I guess that's cool, but, uh, there's I'm rules. not sure that's legal. I mean, if you're, if you're kicking the birds up, it's definitely not legal. I think there's a lot of rules of That's flying over migratory deal. waterfowl for harassment of migratory waterfowl. Right. The, the, the app deal is different to me because I think it helps us because it keeps us legal with the Property trespassing lines. and boundary. Absolutely. It keeps us safe, maybe. We, they might show something to where we really don't want to put ourselves in that particular sure. You know, I think that those help a lot. I think that those have established that we don't have an excuse to trespass. We don't have an excuse right. to be, a, you know, we don't have that. I would that. agree with that. Absolutely. But the drones, man, it's like we got to keep tradition in some part of this. And everybody that, has a cell phone to, to finish that last yeah. thought. I mean, and the drones are, yeah, the that. drones, I, I don't know. I've seen it. I've watched it. I've seen people do it. And I'm just like, man, like, you know, like I've had videographers like, hey, I'm going to get the drone up. No, the birds are still flying. No, you, th- I want to make sure that we watch our P's and Q's of everything that we do because there are laws behind it. And I would tell everybody, go check with your state, then go to the feds and find out what's legal and what's not. No, absolutely. And, and if you've watched, as I do, the foul life from time to time, <laughs> you, and you see the, you know, I think it's very cool to send that drone up and take a picture of your spread. Yeah. And how you hid and why you did it the way you did it. Because you can explain it a lot better to people. You know, a J-hook looks different from the ground than it looks from your... From a bird's eye view. There. But I also noticed that the shadows on those from those decoys aren't very long when you're doing it. So you're waiting until the middle of the day when the birds aren't flying, which is what you should do, obviously. And, um, you know, that kind of thing is completely different than scouting with one. But yeah. there's nothing wrong with getting to, with, you know, sending one up in the middle of the day if the birds aren't flying and, and looking at how your spread looks. That's actually kind of a cool thing to find out because none of us really know how it looks. No, and you're from hide. the ducks and you're hide, hide, right? And it's right. like, yeah, I would not, I would never tell somebody, hey, I'll send that over there and see if the birds are there. I mean, no. it's just crazy to me, but... Agreed. That was awesome. Scouting. Dave Stanley, the Foul Life Podcast, brought to you by Gerber. Dave is fired up. Hopefully, y'all are fired up, too. Canadian border is opening. Is it opening on August 15th to? August 9th. August 9th to American right. residents. And September 7th to the rest of the world. To the rest of the world. Is the plan, the plan. assuming they don't have a, you know, another oh, outbreak. Congratulations yep. to the outfitters in Canada. I'm so yeah, happy. no kidding, boy. They need it. All right, y'all take care. Another episode brought to you by Gerber Gear. Stay sharp, America. Tom Jake, hit that button. This is 2AM Logic. The song is called My Foul Life. <laughs>